Hello, and welcome back to our webinar series, Introduction to Remote Sensing for Ocean and Coastal Applications. We are now in week four, and we will cover coral reefs. We have a very special guest today, Dr. Mark Aiken, who will be giving a presentation on the NOAA Coral Reef Watch tool. His part of the presentation will begin about halfway through the webinar. You can access all of the course materials on the RSET website. Even after this webinar series is over, you will be able to access this website and find a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish. The Spanish translations will be available later. Just a reminder, my name is Sherry Palacios, and I'm your instructor for this webinar series. My co-instructors are Amber McCollum and Cindy Schmidt. They are busy working behind the scenes developing materials, managing Adobe Connect, and communicating with you, our participants. Again, Amber will be your primary contact on chat today. We so appreciate your enthusiasm for this course, and thanks for participating. So we'd like for you to recall from previous weeks the course objectives. They are to provide an overview of NASA Earth observation resources available for open ocean and coastal applications, including a basic understanding of remote sensing of aquatic systems, how to access and visualize NASA Earth science data, how to use NASA, NASA Earth Science data, tools, and products for open ocean and coastal applied science issues, and to conduct live demonstrations of useful ocean and coastal applied science tools, which we did last week, and then we're going to get an overview of the Coral Reef Watch tool this week. This week, we will be discussing coral reefs. I hope your main takeaway from today is an understanding of how remote sensing data can be used to address scientific questions related to coral reef systems and to monitor them in the face of many local and global threats. Today, I will give some background on the biology of tropo tropical skeletarian or stony corals, their allies in the reef system, worldwide distribution, and their ecological importance. I will talk about threats to these systems, including local threats such as overfishing, coastal development, sedimentation, and pollution. I will also talk about global threats from climate change, including rising temperatures and ocean acidification. I will talk about remote sensing of coral reefs, giving you an overview of the types of questions that can, can and cannot be addressed with imagery. I will go into what kind of spatial resolution imagery is needed for particular questions related to corals. I will then review two online tools to access remote sensing data for the Great Barrier Reef. My part of the presentation will take us about halfway through the session. Following my presentation, we will have a very special guest, Dr. Mark Aiken, who will talk about his work on the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, Coral Reef Watch. After his presentation, we will return to the main presentation to wrap up, and then we will be open for questions. I'm really excited to have Dr. Aiken here today, and I think you'll like what he has to show us. Now on to this week's topic, coral reefs. When we think of coral reefs, we usually think of tropical hard coral reefs. There are other corals, like the soft corals, and they are more widely distributed and can be found in cold and dark regions. But the focus of today's session is on the hard corals. The majority of reef building corals are found within tropical and subtropical waters. These typically occur between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitudes. The magenta dots on this map show the location of many stony coral reefs of the world. The amount of coral reef area distributed in these regions of the world varies. Southeast Asia has the greatest extent of coral area, followed by the Western and Eastern Pacific. Australia is famed for its extensive reef, the Great Barrier Reef, located in the northeast part of the continent. Other regions support corals as well, as you see here in this figure. Each of these regions supports rich and varied coral reef systems. Similar to forests around the world, each region has properties and species assemblages unique to that region or subregions within it. The tropical coral reef system includes more than just one group of organisms or habitats. 
and includes the hard corals. The image in the upper left of this panel here on the right shows some examples of different coral species that you could find within a coral reef. What is striking is the diversity in shape of these organisms. Some coral species form spiky shapes and others form more rounded shapes. The environment can influence these shapes. You'll also notice that corals can vary in color. The spatial scale over which one sees different species can vary. Some coral heads are massive and others are diminutive. So when using remote sensing imagery, it is important to know that the spatial scale of the imagery is very important for the types of questions being asked. Other members of the coral neighborhood can include seagrasses, as you see in the upper right. Seagrasses are vascular plants that have reinvaded the sea over the course of their evolution. They are highly sensitive to light availability, as are the hard corals. These plants, like other members of the coral reef system, provide important nursery habitat to ecologically important fish and shellfish species. In the bottom left is an image of a budding mangrove readout. Mangroves are trees or shrubs that grow above the mean sea level in the intertidal zone of coastal and estuarine regions. Mangroves are specially evolved to survive in saline and brackish environments and have a number of adaptations to deal with excess salt. Mangroves form an important transition zone at the land and sea margin. One, as a filter of sediment from upland watersheds, and then secondly, as a physical protection of inland regions against the storm surge. Finally, both the open ocean and upland terrestrial systems play an important role in coral reef system. Nearby land delivers fresh water and nutrients from upland watersheds. Circulation patterns of the open ocean bring pelagic waters into proximity of coral reefs. This mixing provides for the exchange of oxygen and nutrients into the reef area and the export of material from the reef into the open ocean. So what are the hard corals? They are related to jellies and they grow in a hydroform, as you see here in this image on the, this illustration on the right. It's what we call a polyp. Polyps are typically one to three millimeters across and can divide asexually to produce very large colonies numbering in the tens or hundreds of thousands of polyps. Polyps lay down a calcium carbonate skeleton as they grow. Let me see if I can grab my pointer. As you see here. Generations of these polyps form one skeleton upon another, and so grow outward over time to form a larger superstructure known as a coral head. If you look at a cross section or a core of one of these coral heads, you will see lines kind of like tree rings showing the different generations of coral polyps. Coral polyps are pretty simple. They have tentacles that sting prey with their stinging cells called nematocysts. The tentacles sweep the food towards the mouth, and then the food passes into this cavity called the stomach. The food is digested and waste material is released through the mouth. If you note these cells over here in this blow up of the illustration, contained within the coral tissue, those cells are actually dinoflagellates, a type of phytoplankton. These dinoflagellates and the coral polyp are in a mutually symbiotic relationship. These dinoflagellates are commonly called zooxanthellae. The coral provides protection and nutrients, also known as waste products, to the zooxanthellae, and the zooxanthellae help to remove waste, provide oxygen, and also provide some of the end products of photosynthesis to the coral. The coral gets a lot out of the deal, but so does the zooxanthellae. The surface waters of tropical oceans are typically warm and have low nutrients. This symbiotic relationship enables high levels of productivity because those anthelae have access to nutrients and the coral polyp does not have to work as hard to obtain sugars. This is one of the primary reasons coral reefs are hot spots of productivity surrounded by less productive waters. Corals build extensive reef systems, whether from the scale of a coral head to the scale of an entire island or barrier reef that has built up through geological time, corals serve as ecosystem engineers. 
Coral reef systems are home to their allies, the seagrasses and mangroves, as well as diverse populations of the stony corals, soft corals, bacteria, sponges, algae, anemones, fish, turtles, and mammals. They're relative oases of biodiversity in the vast blue ocean. Coral reefs and their allied systems, such as the nearby seagrass beds and mangroves, provide nursery habitat to ecologically and commercially valuable fish species. Coral reefs represent about 0.1% of the ocean's, world ocean's floor, but they help support approximately 25% of all marine species. Their socioeconomic impact affects the livelihoods of about 500 million people around the world, with a net income of approximately 30 billion US dollars. On the right of this slide is a comparison of the productivity of different systems, including an agricultural system. We typically think of tropical rainforests as <clears throat> the most productive systems, but as you can see, coral reefs can exceed by almost double the productivity of these ecosystems. They are extremely productive due to the tight cycling of nutrients between corals and their zooxanthellae. Coral reef systems are truly wonders of the sea, but they are under threat from local and global impacts. Before we go too far, I'd like to point out a publication that came out in 2011. It's titled Reefs at Risk Revisited. It is freely available at the link at the bottom of this slide. Many images in this talk come from this review of the state of coral reefs around the world. They identified local and global threats, which you see listed here. Even since 2011, a lot has happened to reefs. <clears throat> and so it's not captured in the review that I'll be presenting. Our guest speaker will give us some updates on some of those global threats. Local threats identified in the review were coastal development, which includes building of waterfronts, fish farms, destruction of mangrove systems for residential and commercial development, watershed-based pollution, which includes runoff and sedimentation from upland regions. Because of the light requirements of zooxanthellae, those phytoplankton symbionts, Coral systems are sensitive to degraded water quality or the reduction in water transparency. Marine-based pollution and damage. This includes waste products from petroleum extraction and mining activities, anti-falling compounds applied to the bottom of boats, shipping and exchange of ships' dirty ballast water too close to reefs. Damage from anchors deployed over reefs or dragged anchors are a common problem in some regions of the world. Overfishing fishing for the aquarium trade, and destructive fishing, which you see a picture right in the middle at the bottom here. By far, one of, the mo one of the biggest threats to coral reef systems is overfishing. Fishing of top predators permits fish at lower trophic levels to increase in number. Also, the fishing of grazers, fish that eat biofilms and fleshy algae, reduces the number of animals on the reef that keep the fleshy algae in check. The synergistic effect of grazer overfishing and eutrophication or excess nutrients flowing into the system can have a devastating impact on coral reefs as fleshy algae can then dominate or overgrow the reef. Global threats identified here were past and proposed future thermal threats. Rising temperature as a result of climate change is a real threat to coral reef systems throughout the world. Coral bleaching events are not new but global coral bleaching events are new, and Dr. Aiken will give us some more information on that later. Another global threat is the other indicator of human-caused climate change, or ocean acidification. Ocean acidification threatens organism with organisms with calcium carbonate shells. Corals, the larval stages of many commercially important shell shellfish, and pteropods, or sea butterflies, planktonic organisms, all contain calcium carbonate shells that are particularly vulnerable to ocean acidification because of the type of crystalline structure that they're made of. So this problem of ocean acidification threatening marine life is not just isolated to the coral reefs, but actually threatens many ecosystems in temperate and polar waters. So I've described for you some of the local and global threats to coral reef systems. Local threats can vary by region of the world or even within countries. Next, I'll review local threats over six regions of the world. Following that, I'll summarize the global threats. First, let's look at the Middle East. The reefs of the Middle East, the seas surrounding the Arabian Peninsula, represent distinct coral reef regions in the Indian Ocean. Coral reefs make up here make up 6% of the world's coral reefs. 
This region is characterized by extreme swings in temperature seasonally from very warm to colder than what is expected for corals to survive. As a result, it makes a good natural laboratory for how reefs may respond to rising temperature due to climate change. For the most part, coastal areas in this region are sparsely populated, yet some regions are experiencing rapid increases in population and coastal development, as you see in this image down here on the right. Overfishing is the greatest local threat to these coral reef systems. Thermal stress and ocean acidification are expected to increase in threat level into the future. Only about 12% of the reefs in the region are in marine protected areas, primarily in Egypt. The Indian Ocean has about 31,000 square kilometers of coral reefs concentrated in three regions. The Western Indian Ocean along the African continent, the Maldives Islands and Chagos Ridge in the mid-ocean, and then in the east, encircling the Adaman Sea. Fewer reefs are found along the Indian subcontinent, though they are present. This region has 13% of the world's coral reefs. 65 million people live within 30 kilometers of coral reef in this area, and many are dependent on the reef for economic survival, particularly in the Maldives. In terms of local threats, overfishing dominates. The Indian Ocean was hit particularly hard during the 1998 bleaching event, and recovery has been slow. The tsunami of 2004 also had an impact on the reefs near Sumatra in the east. Rising temperatures and the effects of climate change are expected to drastically alter the reefs of the Indian Ocean. 330 marine protected areas are found in this ocean basin, accounting for about 19% of the coral reef extent. Southeast Asia has the most extensive reefs in the world at almost 70,000 square kilometers, or about 28% of the global total. The Coral Triangle, which is situated between the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, and Borneo, has the highest diversity of corals and reef fish of any place in the world. This region is also host to some of the most diverse and extensive mangrove and seagrass ecosystems. The expansion of aquaculture in this region has had a devastating impact on mangrove and seagrass habitat, as these two are typically destroyed to make room for these operations. This region is densely populated, and this population depends on fish for much of its protein. As a result, overfishing is the primary local threat in this region. Blast fishing, the use of explosives, is very common in this region. Marine protected areas have been established in these reef systems, but enforcement is lax, and so these protected areas are not very effective. Australia is home to about 43,000 square kilometers of reef area, or about 17% of the global total. A dominant component of Australia's coral, Australia's coral reefs is the Great Barrier Reef, which is stretches along the northeast coast of The continent. This region has low population density and much of the economy is dependent on the reef as the form of tourism. For the most part, local threats are fairly limited. Three quarters of Australia's reefs are held within marine protected areas. It is the global threats that will have the most impact on Australia. Thermal stress has had a negative impact on Australia's coral reefs. Looking to the future, more than 90% of Australia's reefs are threatened. Coral reefs in the Pacific Ocean occupy about 66,000 square kilometers of area. This region holds more than a quarter of the world's coral reefs. It includes fringing reefs, barrier reefs, atolls. Most of these reefs are found in the Western Pacific. Coral reefs are rare in the Eastern Pacific. More than anywhere else, the people of the Pacific are highly dependent on the resources of the reef. In fact, without the reefs, the livelihoods of many of the people in the region could not exist. The threat of coral bleaching devastating these ecosystems would have widespread impacts on the people living there. One of the greatest local threats in the, regions, in the region is overfishing, followed by the global impact of rising temperature. Finally, we come to the Atlantic. The Atlantic region includes 10% or about 26,000 square kilometers of coral reef habitat. 
These are mostly restricted to the Western Atlantic and include the Caribbean, Bahamas Bank, and then some of the part, some parts in the South Atlantic along the east coast of Brazil. Bermuda is included in this accounting and is noteworthy as it is the farthest poleward outpost where corals can still survive. Compared to the Indo-Pacific, the diversity of coral species in the Caribbean is relatively low. The region is densely populated and some countries are highly dependent on fishing for, um, of the reef. This has resulted in overfishing as a local threat. This region is also very popular as a tourist destination. The mechanical destruction of the seafloor by anchors is relatively common. The image in the bottom right shows the consequences of an anchor dragging across a coral head. Corals in this region have been in decline for decades. Any one stressor is a challenge for the coral reef system. The Caribbean is characterized by multiple stressors, such as coastal development, watershed pollution, and overfishing. What is to be done? The Atlantic and Caribbean host 617 marine protected areas, accounting for 30% of the region's reefs. Temperatures are predicted to rise into the future as a result of climate change. Regions meeting the threshold for coral bleaching are expected to expand poleward. Extended periods of above normal temperatures result in coral expelling zooxanthellae or losing pigment in those cells, as you see in the illustration on the right at the top. So here's an example of how it would look bleached. And so either it's expelled, the zooxanthellae are lost the pigments, and below is the non-bleached part of the um, coral. In the last three years, we have had an unprecedented global coral, coral bleaching event. This image shows a coral head that has lost all of its pigment on the left-hand side of the um, coral head, either through pigment loss or the ejection of the zooxanthellae. On the right is a few weeks later when opportunistic fleshy macroalgae have begun to colonize the bleached coral head. As climate warms, we can expect to see more of these bleaching events. Thermal stress also makes corals more vulnerable to disease as seen in this image on the right. Ocean acidification is the other climate change indicator. This graph shows the correlation you can see on the x-axis over time and on the y-axis, on the left y-axis is CO2 in the atmosphere um, and in the water and on the um, alternate y-axis over here is pH. So this graph shows the correlation between rising levels of CO2 in the atmosphere measured in Mauna Loa and Hawaii with rising ocean CO2 levels at the nearby oceanographic station known as Station Aloha. As more CO2 accumulates in the ocean and as it reacts with water and the ions present there, the pH of the ocean decreases. As you can see, the atmospheric CO2 is increasing and so is ocean partial pressure of CO2. Consequently, lower pH is the result. This lower pH would not be detectable to our skin, but it is enough that it is corrosive to calcium carbonate corals that are constantly bathed in this low pH water. Coral skeletons are made of the aragonite crystalline structure. This is a type of calcium carbonate, it's just a different structure. Aragonite dissolves more readily than calcite, the other calcium carbonate crystalline structure. If you look at the figure here, you will see projections of how aragonite saturation state will change over time. The ocean will get steadily more corrosive for calcium carbonate excreting organisms over time. This threatens the growth and sustainability of coral reef systems. What are some of the characteristics of degraded coral reefs? Reduced habitat complexity or reduced biodiversity. Phase shifts from stony corals to fleshy macroalgae, or soft corals like sea fans and sponges. Reduced number of grazing fish and other fish species. Coral bleaching, which we've just discussed, and physical destruction. In addition to ecological impacts of degraded coral reefs, there are also expected socioeconomic impacts as well. In this example, reef dependence is based on reef associated population, reef fisheries employment, nutritional dependence on fish and seafood, 
reef associated export value, reef tourism, and shoreline protection from reefs. Countries and territories are characterized according to their quartiles, as you see these different categories here. Southeast Asia is a region in which a large proportion of the population is dependent on reef resources. Adaptive capacity is based on economic resources, education, health, governance, access to markets and agricultural resources. Australia has the adaptive capacity to manage the human dependence on the reef. Not all countries are so adaptable in the face of declining reef quality. This plot combines the previous two and shows the vulnerability based on exposure to reef threats, reef dependence, and adaptive capacity. Again, Southeast Asia is extremely vulnerable. Viewed as a Venn diagram, we can see which countries are particularly vulnerable, located here right in the center area. Some of these include Indonesia, the Philippines, and Fiji. How are we dealing with these local and global threats to coral reef systems? One way is through conservation efforts, including marine protected areas. Another way is through reseeding the reef. Remote sensing can be used to monitor the success of marine protected areas. So what is the state of affairs of remote sensing of coral reefs? There is a recent special issue this year on the topic of remote sensing of coral reef monitoring. It is edited by Stuart Finn and Chris, Chris Rolsema. If you download this presentation, you will be able to follow the hyperlink on the top of this slide by clicking on the editor's name. You will be taken to an open access journal, so it's freely available. If you're interested in gaining an overview of the current questions in this topic, I encourage you to read the review by Headley et al. And I have his name listed right here. In fact, this figure on the right comes from that paper. Remote sensing is used for a number of purposes in coral reef systems. It is used to measure benthic type, reef structure, water quality, and sea surf temp surface temperature. This figure gives a seagrass and mangrove perspective of what type of spatial scale um, and temporal scale might be useful. On the x-axis here, I have the spatial resolution, and on the y-axis is the temporal resolution. And what of those is needed to address different types of questions. No one remote sensing mission can capture the full range of questions that are out there. One thing that is important to understand is what type of spatial, temporal, and spectral resolution imagery is needed to address the question of interest. If there is a mismatch between sensor type and question, then it is not possible to credibly address the question. So what are we talking about in terms of scale? Well, for example, to observe water quality, in this example, sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, and turbidity over here, water quality, a spatial resolution of about 500 meters to one kilometer is sufficient, and at a temporal range of hours to weeks, or depending on your question, even monthly or an annual survey. If a person would like to observe coral taxonomy, however, the spectral, spatial, and temporal requirements are different. For this question, a spatial resolution of 0.1 meters to 1 meter and a rate on the order of months or one month is needed. Depending on the method used, hyperspectral imagery may also be needed. As you can see by reading the content of the different bubbles in this plot, there is a wide diversity in question areas. We have come a long way in imaging coral reef systems. In fact, we are even moving into modeling their productivity using remote sensing imagery as input. These are exciting times for remote sensing of coral reefs. There's a great deal of effort being invested to deploy sensors that can address coral reef questions. I have a couple of tables on this slide and on the next slide, and they're a little bit busy, and I encourage you to download the um, presentation located in the lower right pod. Just walking briefly through it, I just wanted to talk about some of the environmental factors that can be addressed with remote sensing observations. These include things like photic depth that you see here on the upper left as a way to address water transparency. You can also look at other environmental factors such as sedimentation, pollution, and so on um, listed in this table here. 
Reading across the table, the paper identifies which proxy or measurement from the satellite can be used to assess that environmental factor identified in the far left column. The third column gives an honest assessment of how well the proxy or measurement describes that environmental factor. The sensor or technology column provides information on the type of sensor that is needed to identify the environmental factor. So for this photo depth example, we would need to use a moderate or high spatial resolution satellite to obtain a data product for light attenuation in the water column. So for example, if I wanted to look at the diffuse attenuation data product known as K490, that might be used to address this question. This measurement has a high likelihood of having an accurate relationship or association to the environmental factor of interest, in this case, photic depth. I won't go through each one of these, but again, if you follow this link and you look at this table, you will pro be provided with more information in the paper. This table shows the different types of remote sensing technologies there are for addressing scientific questions. So for example, to assess reef extent. High and moderate resolution satellite and airborne measurements are needed to look at reef extent. You can see that spectral resolution varies depending on the type of question being asked. The images on this slide give a graphical view of the um, tables I was just showing you of how spatial scale influences the types of questions that are possible to ask. For example, in the upper left, the scientific question is benthic mapping to species. For such a question, small spatial scale is needed. In fact, probably even smaller than the 2.4 meter listed here. It probably needs sub-meter pixel resolution. Moving across the top of the images, you see reef structure, water quality, and sea surface temperature. To address these questions, coarser spatial resolution is fine. This image provides an idea of how coarser and coarser resolution data affects the fidelity of the data to the actual features in the water. A great deal of effort over the last several decades has gone into imaging reefs, mapping them, and assessing their biodiversity. Work is now underway to relate remote sensing observations to productivity of coral reefs. One example of a project that's just been funded through NASA is the NASA Coral Earth Venture. I encourage you to follow the links listed at the top of this slide to get an understanding of the Coral Reef Airborne Laboratory and how they're addressing the question, what is the relationship between coral reef condition and biogeophysical forcing parameters? Or how can we use remote sensing in models to understand the condition of the reef? <clears throat> The two remote sensing tools I'm discussing today both come from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology's eReefs program. eReefs began in January 2012 as a collaborative project to contribute to the protection and preservation of the Great Barrier Reef. It forms the first step in building comprehensive coastal information systems for Australia. This program is intended to combine remote sensing, in situ data collection, and modeling tools for monitoring of coral reefs in Australian waters. The first tool is the ReefTemp tool. ReefTemp is a web-based data access tool, tool to view sea surface temperature of the Great Barrier Reef. It provides near real-time data on the reef. Using the tool, you can choose the date, the temporal range used for mosaicing the data, and the data product like sea surface temperature selected here, or sea surface temperature anomaly. It is possible to download the data in KMZ format for later, later use in Google Earth. This is an intuitive interface for quickly accessing temperature data for the region, and it's freely available. If your interest leans more towards water quality over the reef or an understanding of the water transparency, then the eReefs Marine Water Quality Dashboard is the tool to use. As discussed earlier, water transparency can have a big impact on the survival of the coral symbiotic zooxanthellae, as well as nearby seagrass beds. The dashboard is a data portal that provides near real-time data access to water quality data for different reef regions of Australia. The tool allows for viewing, statistics, and another, a number of other functions. After you are finished with your inputs, you can output the imagery in NetCDF or GeoTIFF format. This tool is also freely available. This brings us to our special guest speaker, Dr. Mark Aiken, who will talk about the tool he and his team have been developing at the US NOAA, at, um, US 
National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Dr. Aiken is a coral reef specialist with a PhD in biological oceanography from the University of Miami. He is coordinator of NOAA's Coral Reef Watch Program, an effort focused on monitoring of coral reef ecosystems through satellite, in situ, and paleoenvironmental observation. Coral Reef Watch provides the only source of satellite-based monitoring alerts and warnings of upcoming coral mass bleaching events. Dr. Aiken has published on various topics in coral reef ecology, especially the impact of climate change and other disturbance on coral reefs. This includes El Nino impacts on Eastern Pacific coral reefs in coral reef ecology and carbonate budgets, thermal stress and coral bleaching, ocean acidification, oil spills, and so on. He is an active participant in a number of national and international efforts and working groups. He has testified before the U.S. House of Representatives and has participated in several congressional briefings. We really appreciate having Dr. Aiken with us here today to talk about his and his team's work on NOAA's Coral you. Reef Watch. Uh, can you? Thank you, Dr. Aiken. All right, very good. We're glad to be with all of you. And I'll be talking a bit about some of the tools that we have at NOAA's Coral Reef Watch. And I'll be putting this in the context of the leaching event that's going on right now that uh, is the one that Sherry's been referring to. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, you saw some images earlier, but these are some shots during this bleaching event Oops. Um, in uh, American Samoa starting in uh, December of 2014. You see this picture of a healthy coral reef. This is the airport reef uh, near um, uh, on the island of Tutuila uh, near the harbor of uh, Pongo Pongo. And you can see the beautiful extent of the corals there. It's a, a lush environment. But this event, the warm water came in and uh, led to severe bleaching throughout uh, parts of American Samoa as well as elsewhere in the world. And here you can see that same reef, in the same location uh, during the, the, the greatest extent of the bleaching in February of 2015, just two months later. Unfortunately, what this did was not only cause bleaching of the corals, but we also saw tremendous amount of uh, mortality. Almost all of the corals on that reef died. And here you see a shot of that reef dead and covered with algae. So it's been a, a very dramatic event that's had major impacts. As uh, Sherry was saying, the uh, coral bleaching is the result of the loss of the symbiotic algae living inside coral tissues. Uh, the coral in the lower right we're seeing is, is one that's in a healthy condition. It's a uh, uh, massive coral. This was found in uh, um, in off the coast of Mexico. And this one right beside it, you can see, is showing signs of bleaching. And so what has occurred is that because of stress, the coral has ejected the algae out of their tissues and into the water column. It leaves the coral starving, and it leaves them uh, clear in color. You can see right through the, uh, uh, the tissues to the skeleton underneath. All right, so when, you, um, when the corals bleach in this way, uh, it, it leaves the corals starving and it leaves them much more at risk of disease. So moving on uh, to talk about our products, at, at Coral Reef Watch, what we use are satellite observations and sea surface temperatures. To do that, we're using a blended product that uses a combination of all of the available geostationary and uh, polar orbiting satellites to produce this operational five kilometer resolution uh, geopolar blended sea surface temperature. From that, we, we not only look at the sea surface temperatures, but we look at the difference between those sea sur surface temperatures and the normal conditions. That's called an anomaly. So here you see the sea surface temperature anomaly chart for that same day in 2014. Now this is valuable and tells you how unusual conditions are from what is normal at that time of year. But for corals, you really want to know how is that uh, temperature different from what the corals are used to seeing during the warm time of year. That's the index that we use for bleaching. So here you see our hotspot product, which tells you on a daily basis how different the temperatures are than 
the warmest temperatures of the year, the Coral Sea. And in fact, uh, what you're looking at here is a, a positive only anomaly called the hotspot product. And there you can see the areas from zero to one are in blue colors, and then you get into yellows, oranges, and reds as the temperatures get warmer and warmer. This is a nice product, but it only tells you what's happening today. And what you really want to know is what's been going on over a longer period of time. For that, we add up our hotspots uh, over a, a period of 12 weeks. And, and from that, we have our degree heating week product. The degree heating week is then a sum of the hotspots during that time. So it's a combination of how much above normal the temperatures are and how long that anomaly lasts. Finally, we combine those two products, the hotspots and the degree heating weeks, into a product that you see here, our bleaching alert area product. And this breaks it down not into a fully quantitative um, uh, scale, but a, a qualitative scale. It tells you the blue is showing areas where there's no stress. The yellow is showing where there's a bleaching watch, which means that there's any hotspot present. Bleaching warning is any time that the hotspot is one degree or more. That's when there's a good chance of having uh, bleaching. And then the probabilities of bleaching go up as the uh, degree heating weeks accumulate. And at four degree weeks, you have this alert level one condition, uh, which is the uh, the one that you see in the, the first of the reds. So that's when you get to four degree weeks of stress. And when you reach eight degree weeks of stress, it's alert level two. And you'll be seeing a lot of this diagram as I go through the rest of the talk. Our current products are big improvements over what we used to use. And it was, uh, in fact, through funding um, by uh, NASA and uh, NOAA that we were able to improve on our old products. Our, our old products were 50 kilometer products that you see here down below. Uh, it was a weekly product, uh, the, or a twice weekly product uh, at a 50 kilometer resolution, only using the data coming from a single polar orbiting satellite. Now, instead of that, we're using this combination of uh, a suite of uh, at least two polar orbiting satellites and four geostationary satellites giving us a tremendous increase in the amount of data and a higher resolution, now at five kilometer resolution. In addition to the global pictures you were seeing earlier, this has allowed us to get down to some finer scale products that provide information on what's happening on a regional basis. Here on the upper left, you're seeing the uh, regional uh, bleaching alert data for uh, the main Hawaiian islands. And this image where you're seeing uh, the, the main image is at the five kilometer level. You can see how much blockier the old 50 kilometer products were um, when we were using those in the past. We can take this and combine it with data from climate models where we not only can look at the current conditions, this panel on, in the upper right, um, the, the upper left of those images is the current conditions from satellites. We can then combine that with information that we're seeing from the uh, climate models and tell us what's happening or likely to happen months in advance. So this is one month out, this is two months out, and this is three months out into the future. And these gauges on the right-hand side are showing you uh, the uh, extent of uh, thermal stress and this, the risk to the corals at that time. We're also providing these long time scale images here you're seeing it, the ongoing two-year uh, time scale, um, uh, time series of sea surface temperatures and of the amount of thermal stress at that same location, uh, this one being an example from the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So let's go through and see what these, uh, how these are being used and, and what they're saying about the event going on now. A number of groups have taken these five kilometer products and are using them on a regional basis. What you see here are four different uh, examples of newsletters put out. Uh, some of the earlier ones were like this one down in, uh, in Florida. We have two different programs in Florida that have the Bleach Watch program that use our products to tell people what's likely to be happening in the near future on their reefs and get reports back from, from others. 
Above that, you're looking at a similar product part of the Eyes of the Reef program in Hawaii, uh, and they're doing the same thing in, in their region. On a wider basis, here is the Cordio program. The Cordio East Africa program is actually expanding to, to provide products for more of the Indian Ocean. Uh, but here you're seeing the Western Indian Ocean. Um, uh, our products being used to let people know what's going on, and then they're collecting bleaching reports from people throughout the area. And then finally, one of the most recent ones is this Caribbean Coral Reef Watch program, which is a part of a, a regional climate program in the Caribbean. So this event that we're seeing now, the one that Sherry was talking about, is, is actually very unusual. Not only is it a global bleaching event, and it's the, the third documented global bleaching event, uh, but it, it's also the first time one of these global bleaching events has been so long-lasting. Uh, the, the first widespread bleaching was seen in 1983, the first global event in 1998, and the second global event was in 2010. This event started in uh, about June of 2014 in Guam and the, the Mariana Islands over here uh, to the left. It then, in, uh, in uh, September and into October, started seeing, uh, sorry, August and September, we started seeing bleaching in Florida, and then in September and October in Hawaii. Then later on in the year, we saw some of the worst bleaching they've ever seen in the, in the Marshall Islands. This, by the way, was only the second time that they had ever seen bleaching in the main Hawaiian islands. Uh, it extended down, especially through to uh, the island of Oahu. This is important because as we move into the next year, we saw bleaching again in Hawaii. Here you're seeing 2015, and you can see the bleaching was much worse in Hawaii once it got to fall. But to go through the time sequence, we first saw bleaching in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific, including the Samoas and Fiji, then popping up in the Indian Ocean, uh, the British Indian Overseas Territory, the Maldives, parts of the Southern Red Sea. And then um, as the El Nino really started forming later in 2015, we saw bleaching in uh, the islands uh, of the nation of Kiribati, in Panama, in the Caribbean, and then back in Hawaii. The event unfortunately didn't end in 2015 and it's still ongoing now. This is showing a list of the places where it's been seen in 2016 uh, and it followed that same sequence that we were talking about a moment ago where it went into the South Pacific across into the Indian Ocean over to Southeast Asia. Uh, we're continuing to see bleaching going on now. The worst right now uh, is around the Philippines and parts of, uh, uh, of East Asia. We're expecting to see severe bleaching nearby, and I'll show you that in, in just a moment. To give you an idea of how bad this event was, this was uh, so, some data that came out of the Great Barrier Reef where they had 93% of their reefs seeing bleaching. The far northern Great Barrier Reef had 95% of reefs with severe bleaching and 50% mortality in the, north, the far northern reefs. This was a very severe event, and to give you an idea of what it looked like, here are some images of, of the bleaching as it was going on in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, great images from the Catlin Seaview Survey and from Justin Marshall of uh, the Coral Watch Program. Here you're seeing not only bleaching of corals, but you're seeing bleaching of sea anemones and bleaching of uh, um, giant uh, clams. These are all organisms that are able to take, uh, that normally have zooxanthellae, the symbiotic algae, and lost them because of the high temperatures. Unfortunately, what we saw in the Great Barrier Reef was a lot of mortality. Here you're seeing some soft corals falling apart, just melting, uh, as it were, uh, as a result of the bleaching. Dead giant clams in large numbers, uh, extensive uh, mortality of, of the giant clam population there as well as the reef itself. Corals were lost, but also the, what they're now seeing is that the, the fish had just disappeared. It's showing that there's been a, a real collapse of the ecosystem in many areas. If we go elsewhere in the world, in the central equatorial Pacific, 
It was even worse. There was some 80% mortality of corals in uh, the Christmas Island. Um, and then in uh, Jarvis Island, which is also in the central equatorial Pacific, uh, they saw not over 95% mortality of the corals. Very severe bleaching and, and high mortality. You can see our plots are, are actually uh, broken in two ways. They, they, they were pushed past the, the normal limits that we scaled them to, uh, where you see the jumping out the top of the image there. But also our, our degree heating with product normally adds up over a 12-week period. We've never seen it before where we're, there was an entire month, of, I mean, an entire year of, of bleaching. So to sum up this event, we saw over 40% of reefs reaching that alert level one or alert level two condition. The alert level two area was greater than the size of Massachusetts or uh, the, the country of Wales. Um, yeah, many of the reefs, in fact, over half of them have been exposed twice. UF's reefs have actually been hit even harder because of, of geography and 72% of U.S. reefs have been hit with alert level one or two conditions. We're going to continue to see this going on through the end of the year, at least. Uh, we're expecting severe bleaching uh, in the Northeast Philippines, in Micronesia, Guam, the Commonwealth of the Northern uh, Mariana Islands, um, as well as uh, um, in parts of the uh, uh, Western uh, Marshall Islands. We're also expecting there to be bleaching again in Hawaii this year, not as bad as last year, we're hoping, uh, probably only alert level one conditions, uh, as well as uh, bleaching in the Caribbean, uh, at least reaching alert level one, uh, in some areas probably alert level two conditions. So, you know, this has been a severe event, it's continuing to, to go on, and, and one of the questions is what can be done about it, and there have been some actions that actually have been taken through this event. Thailand, on the basis of our uh, Outlook products, actually closed a number of their dive sites to reduce the additional stress that comes to uh, the reefs as, uh, as a result of, um, of, of divers being present on the, on the reefs. In uh, Hawaii, as a result of our, our forecasts indicating there was going to be severe bleaching, they went out and they collected up specimens of a large number of the rarest of their, their corals. And in fact, one of the corals that's down here in the, the lower right-hand corner of the, of the aquarium was uh, bleached uh, so severely that, that all of them died and that species can no longer be found in the wild. Uh, they're still looking, hoping that it's alive in the wild, but at least it's alive in the aquaria at this nursery at this point. So to, to, to wrap this up, uh, the five kilometer product suite that, as I indicated, NASA helped out with the uh, pr production of this, these new products came out just in time for this bleaching event. They've got higher resolution and we, we're providing better regional products and they've really been used to a great extent by the folks in the, in the community. The 2014 or 2017 bleaching is the longest global bleaching event ever. It's the most widespread. Uh, it, the bleaching has often been repeated already in places and we're thinking that we may be seeing a third year in a row in Hawaii and Florida. And it's, it's affected a tremendous amount of reefs around the world. You can follow, you can get uh, see all of our products on our website at coralreefwatch.noaa.gov and you can follow the alerts on bleaching of, uh, as we get them out either on our Facebook page or on Twitter. Just to give you an idea of the, the team that's involved, my, my thanks to all of them because they're the ones who make all of these possible. Here you're looking at the team that's a, a combination of folks in College Park, Maryland, folks in Australia, and uh, uh, we have a, a student working with us from the City University of New York. So we, we have people all over working to help us uh, get this information out to people around the world. With that, I'll be able to answer questions after uh, Sherry does a quick wrap up.
Thank you, Dr. Aiken, for your presentation. In just a short moment, we will move on to the questions. Um, I just wanted to, let's get this up here. Just want to give a quick summary. Of uh, this week's session, we talked about coral biology, local and global threats, remote sensing, and the types of questions we can ask, and a few examples, including Dr. Aiken's Norma Coral Reef Watch. Since this is the last week of the course, we wanted to make sure that uh, we hope that to let you know that we hope you gained an understanding of remote sensing and aquatic systems and how to access these data visualization tools and processing tools through NASA. We hope you appreciate and enjoy the demonstrations of applied science tools developed in partnership with NASA, including last week's animal movement um, talk by Dr. Roffer and this week's talk by Dr. Aiken. Just wanted to note this image on the right is an eye of an algal storm. It's a cyanobacterial bloom in the Baltic Sea. And now that you've taken this course, especially after last week's physical oceanography overview, you understand that this is an algal bloom that's caught in an eddy. And you can even see, let's see if I've got my arrow here, this boat track going through the eddy. Just a reminder, my name is Sherry. And I've been your course instructor. I'd like to thank Amber McCollum for all of her effort managing communications with you during the series, Elizabeth Hook at RSET for reviewing and editing the slides. And if you'd like to email me questions after the course is over, please feel free to use this email address listed here. Thank you for your participation in the webinar series. We appreciate your interest. We will now take time to answer questions. After the course is over, please remember to submit your course survey. Amber has been posting the link to that survey, and also you will receive email after the course. This fe your feedback is very important to us for designing future webinar series. Okay, so we will now open it up for questions. Dr. Aiken, if you'd like to unmute and respond to some of these questions. Um, I think that you can see the popping up here in the pod. Just did. And uh, yes, in, in fact, one of the questions is about ocean acidification. It, it varies between corals, but in some of the corals, what's been found is that corals living in more acidic waters are in fact more sensitive to high temperatures. Uh, the same thing applies to corals living in water with nutrient pollution. So a lot of these dressers can actually act together in combination, and that can, can cause a, a change in the sensitivity of the corals uh, to things like thermal stress. So it, it's tough. We, we don't have a lot of details on that in terms of how we could actually build it into our products, but we do know that there's some greater sensitivity. I also see the, the question that's related, which is if different species have different tolerances. I mean, absolutely. Uh, the tolerances you're seeing are general sort of reef level tolerances. And so the bleaching starts with the more sensitive corals. So where normally you have bleaching at four degree weeks uh, and uh, you have widespread bleaching and significant mortality at eight degree weeks, that mainly uh, is, is something that uh, occurs at the, uh, with the more sensitive corals. The more hardy corals that are able to tolerate higher temperatures may not bleach in, at, at all until you get up to like eight degree weeks and then uh, uh, mortality doesn't set in until you get to say 12 or more. It depends on the species, but it certainly uh, is, the, these provide products that are, are quite accurate in terms of alerting people of what may be going on. Uh, they're not perfect predictors, but the design of these is to be a, a product that alerts uh, resource managers for the potential of bleaching. Okay, we have time for about one or two more questions. Um, I see a few scrolling up here. One is on the accuracy and how you assess the accuracy of the alerts. So for that, the, the main way is we compare it against reports that we have coming in from people in the field. The problem is there's no longer a global database of coral bleaching observations. So we don't have a way to do the sort of quantitative uh, accuracy testing 
uh, that would really like to be able to do. Um, that would require a, a better database of observations. We can do that for various re regions uh, where there are more comprehensive monitoring programs in place. Um, those tend to uh, show that our, our products, the, the four degree week is, uh, is pretty close and somewhere around eight, maybe 10 uh, degree weeks for the onset of mortality, uh, at least based on our work in the Caribbean. There was a paper that we published in um, PLOS One in 2010 on the big 2005 Caribbean bleaching event, and it, that was one of the ways that we were able to test the accuracy of the products. So we're getting close to the end here, and I wanted to ask Dr. Aiken, is there anything that you'd like to leave our participants with before we sign off? Well, one of the other things that I'll mention is that, um, that that I didn't get into is we also have products we're developing now to use uh, satellites for ocean colors. Um, ocean color can give us information about pollution, runoff, and uh, threats of those sorts, uh, whether it's sediment stress or whether it's nutrients. And those are some things that we're we're currently developing for a limited number of sites right now. Um, the uh, uh, there are a large number of things we'd like to be able to do, and you know, given enough time and money, there's, uh, there, there's a lot more that we could do uh, to help protect coral reefs using satellite remote sensing. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Aiken, for participating and giving this overview of Coral Reef Watch. And to our participants, I would like to say thank you for participating in the program, and we hope to see you at another future webinar. Thank you.